for this feast of St. John of the Cross, we heard this from the lesson. Be sober, for I am even now ready to be sacrificed, and the time of my dissolution is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Words from St. Paul's letter to Timothy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Blessed John Henry Newman explained how the good Lord makes every event in the world a type of those that follow, history proceeding forward as a circle ever enlarging. So types are real things. They're people, they're events, they're things in the past. They really happened. Somehow, mysteriously, God makes them prefigure or foreshadow future events. Thus, a few Sundays ago, we examined how the prophet Jonas acted as an amazing type of all salvation history, including our own time. God is saying something with these types, that these events are connected. In other words, history is connected. Only he can do this. Now, it seems to me, from what I know of St. John of the Cross, he is yet another example of how history proceeds forward as a circle ever enlarging by way of types. So let's look into the life of today's saint and see if this is true or not. He lived in the 16th century, a time of much heresy, apostasy, war and revolution with the Protestants and all that was going on in Europe and the Muslims breaking in from the East. Well, it's the same as true with us. 20 and 21st century, we've had lots of wars, lots of revolution, lots of apostasy. It's so sad. Lots of heresy. It's all over. He worked as a young man in a hospital dedicated to helping those dying primarily of the unsavory new disease from the new world, a disease that no one would contract if they remained chaste and kept their marriage vows. These men had this disease and were dying and he was there to help them. Our times are marked by this too. Similar things for similar causes. St. John worked among them without being affected by them. In other words, it is possible to work in this world without being tainted or stained. St. John joined the Carmelites, but decided to seek refuge in the Carthusians. He was really trying to run away because it was not his vocation to live in that secluded life. He wanted to enter a sort of enclave, you could think, a place of safety. He was doing what some, I think, wrongly, in my estimation, call the Benedict Option. The world's in big trouble. I'm going to go hide in a cave my, or my little enclave. Is it not true that many a Catholic today is seeking a safe haven somewhere in some group or some place to be safe, to not have to worry about all the troubles? Some are called preppers and others join some splinter group where they can be openly complain amongst themselves, but not have to worry about fighting the counter revolution that is so painful. Many priests are trying to be hermits. I know many that thought they have a hermit vocation. St. Teresa of Jesus prevented St. John from going. She said, get back here and fight with me. I think that's true today, too. We need more willing to engage in the battle. As we heard in the lesson today, fight the good fight. Unless you're called to be a Carthusian, get back over here and engage in the battle. St. John then engaged in the battle by working with St. Teresa by beginning the Discalced Carmelites for the men. They were a return to the ancient rule, the Discalced Carmelites, the ancient practices, the Black Plague and other things like wars and various cultural upheavals caused the Carmelites to mitigate much of the old rule. Hope this sounds familiar. Do we not have this mitigation going on in our time? because of the same causes versus the ancient rule, right? So now we have the worldwide, it's worldwide, it's not just the Carmelites, we 
We have the Novus Ordo, which is a mitigation versus the traditional Latin mass and all its traditions and all its ancient uh, disciplines. There's a battle going on. It's the discoused versus the, the coust all over again, but on a larger scale. God works by way of types. We've been here before. St. John experienced many hardships because of his adherence to the old ways. Many abandoned him. Many lacked the gratitude that they should have had toward all the good he had done to them and the loyalty they owed him as a friend. But they abandoned him. St. Teresa became very concerned about this if, at one point because it was like he was all alone, a Job. Yet he persevered and was eventually arrested by the mitigated friars. And that's when everybody abandoned him, especially. He was imprisoned by the Calc Carmelites in their monastery in Toledo. I think the friar who did it was named Tostado. St. John was then brought before the community daily in the refectory where he was encouraged to repent of his efforts to renew the ancient disciplines. To aid him in this act of repentance, this forced conversion, they would scourge him almost daily, feed him penitential meals such that he began to lose weight and strength, suffering from malnutrition. He was approaching death. After months of being locked up in a narrow cell and suffering psychological torture as well, they would speak in his hearing outside his cell that he was the only one left. You're all alone. You're a Job on a dunghill. Nobody wants to come near you. He was rescued eventually by Our Lady. She showed him how to get out of the room and through the window using his bed sheets. And even they were not long enough and had to be rescued before he fell to his death. An angel came. Many priests and people have felt the hand of authority wrongly used in our time coming down upon them suppressing them out of due order, perhaps, locking them up in a cell, as it were, torturing them even psychologically. We must persevere in this narrow place, and Our Lady will rescue us too, as she promised at Fatima. My Immaculate Heart will triumph. St. John of the Cross learned much in that dark cell, just like the mother of the seven sons in Second Maccabees chapter 7. Suffering willingly for the love of God and his truth brought forth profound professions of faith in that chapter. It's very edifying to read it. St. John of the Cross, in his narrow cell, formulated his poems upon which is based his greatest works, The Ascent of Mount Carmel and The Dark Night of the Soul. Later in his life, his majesty appeared to him and asked him what he would have for his labors. Just like St. Thomas. What would you have, St. Thomas? You've spoken well of me. His response, Lord, to suffer and be despised for thee. He learned his lesson in the cell. For through that comes great love, great professions of faith. So he, he was despised and he did suffer and out came more acts of faith hope and charity such that he is the church's mystical doctor today we're in a pinch no doubt about it we're in a cell we're in a darkness suffering and being despised yet this is where we will have the greatest chance to know and love and serve god with the greatest merit and yes i know it is painful the psychological part is the worst. How few appreciate the passive purifications of the nights spoken of by St. John. So St. John had three nights, the night of the senses, the night of the soul, and the night of the spirit. And each one had an active part, a part that we do on our own. We have to work at it. And then there's the passive part, the part that God does to us, usually through other people. And we resist those. I know I complain all the time. I resist. But they're there for a reason. If we only embrace them, who knows how quickly God would work. The whole church is passing through one of these now, a passive purification. Professions of faith are coming out. People are saying amazing things. They're learning their faith. 
People are learning as never before, while many are apostatizing in some way or other too. It's amazing. It's really the caust and discaust all over again. When St. John came to Salamanca, where the university was located to govern the house for the Carmelite seminarians, he was introduced to a young Augustinian nun that was held by all the faculty to be an amazing oracle. They were enamored of her, and they would go visit her regularly and ask her questions. St. John discovered very quickly that she was, in fact, possessed by devils. He asked her, please repeat after me, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And she said, the word was made man and dwelt among you. He knew right away that was a devil speaking. Then he spent his time exercising her primarily, not with exorcism prayers, but with teaching her the catechism of the spiritual life. This too is a type. All the intellectuals of our time seem to be pursuing occult-based ideas and philosophies. As John Sr. and now Dennis Quinn, an expert in this field, in his excellent book, Iris Exiled, says that occultism is the broadest and most profound source of modernism. They both are saying the same thing. Occultism, secret knowledge, inner, you know, inspirations welling up from inside, from inspirations from who knows where, right? In St. John's time, there were many claiming to be enlightened by God and having charismatic gifts. It is the same now, too, with the emphasis being upon individual conscience and direct inspiration from God, which is very Protestant in its origins. Now we have many oppressions, obsessions, possessions, and the like. The devil is very much at home in the intellectual environment of our day. He is said to be unleashed now. He exercised, that is St. John, exercised the nun by teaching her a catechism, most especially the spiritual life, namely what we find in the Ascent of Mount Carmel. Oh, St. John, you truly are a type of our time. We could probably pull out a few more ideas of his life and see that it's true, a few more facts. But we beg him now, St. John, return, come back. We need you again. We need to learn our catechism of the spiritual life in order to make great and glorious professions of faith, hope, and charity in our efforts of countering once again the revolution that has risen up to great heights in the world, oppressing the church, putting her through an oppressive, passive purification. Come back, St. John, and teach us how to persevere in a narrow place, waiting for Our Lady to rescue us with the triumph of her immaculate heart. Come back, St. John, and teach us to desire suffering and even scorn in order to merit this heavenly triumph and our own passive purification so that the ancient rituals and disciplines can once again flourish for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.